Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India This is Dr. Vishal Tivedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati. And what we were discussing, we were discussing about the different properties of the enzyme. And in this context, so far what we have discussed, we have discussed about the development of this uh, field of the enzymology. We discuss about the nomenclature and classifications in the module 1. And then subsequent to that, we have also discussed about the structural properties of the enzyme where we have discussed about the primary structures, secondary structure, tertiary structure and quaternary structure. And in the previous two modules, we are discussing about how you can be able to produce these enzyme in the bulk quantities so that you can be able to utilize them for studying the property of the enzyme or for other kinds of industrial applications. So in this context, so far what we have discussed, we have discussed about the cloning, uh, isolating the gene uh, into from the genome either by utilizing the PCR or with the help of the isolating the clone from the genomic library or the cDNA library. Subsequent to that, we have also discussed how you can be able to clone this fragment into a suitable vector. And once you got the clone into the vector, you can be able to deliver this DNA into the suitable host. And once you got the transformed colonies, uh, you can be able to utilize them for the uh, screening and as well as subsequent to that for the protein production. So what we have discussed so far is that you are going to get the uh, transformed bacteria and or the transformed host that you are going to put it for the screening, right? And once you got the screen, you got the clone containing uh, host cells. Now this clone can be used for the protein production or the enzyme production. Protein or the enzyme production. Now when we talk about the enzyme production, enzyme production uh, will depend on the type of host what you are going to use for the production. So as far as the cloning is concerned, the cloning can be done into two different types of vectors. It can be done into the cloning vector or it can be done into the expression vector. In some cases, when you know that the uh, enzyme or the protein what you are expressing is uh, toxic in nature. So in those cases, you do not uh, do the cloning reactions, uh, cloning uh, related uh, performance or cloning related uh, operations into a expression vector because then uh, you are going to produce a protein and then eventually it is going to kill the cell. So that is how you are going to use the, in a cloning vector. Apart from the uh, uh, this uh, cloning vector can also be able to use for studying the mechanism of the transcription, replications and the preparation of the genomic and as well as the cDNA library. Whereas the expression vector is exclusively being used for studying the mechanism of the translation or as well as the enzyme production and ultimately it is going to give you the enzyme of your interest. Now when you talk about the enzyme production, the enzyme production is a complicated process and it requires the discrete steps. So before getting into the uh, different steps uh, with the recombinant DNA, we should first understand how the protein production occurs in a particular cell. So protein production is, uh, is, is a, is a multi-step process, right? In a, uh, is a multi-step process and these steps uh, you have, you, you have to follow following steps. In the step one, 
the binding of the RNA polymerase to the promoter element to start the transcription to form the messenger RNA. So, in the step 1 you are actually going to produce the messenger RNA and then this messenger RNA is going to be utilized in the uh, step 2. So, as soon as the messenger RNA is synthesized a translational machinery starts the synthesis of the protein or the enzyme. The protein synthesis starts usually at the start codon which is called as AUG and ends at the stop codon which are called as UAE, UGA or UAG. In bacteria transcription and translation occurs simultaneously because there is no nucleus right. So, transcription and translation occurs simultaneously whereas in the in the eukaryotic system you are going to have the transcription inside the nucleus and then the translation is going to be in the outside the cytosol. So, that is why in a eukaryotic system the transcription and translation are not going to be together whereas in the bacterial system you are going to have the transcription and translation together. So, in the step 1 from the gene you are going to produce the messenger RNA. So, RNA polymerase is going to sit on to the promoter region and then it is actually going to synthesize the messenger RNA which is responsible for this. This messenger RNA is going to be modified you know post translational modification and all that and then ultimately the, uh, the first codon which is the AUG is going to be uh, the place where the R ribosome is going to sit and that is how it is actually going to start forming the synthesis of the uh, proteins. So, and then it is going to synthesize the polypeptide. This polypeptide is, in, is going to be get folded and that is how you are going to get the folded functional proteins. Uh, you can actually be able to read this so that you can be able to understand the subsequent process what we are going to do inside the host so that uh, and it will actually be able to helpful. So, I have given you a reference which you can actually be below. Uh, to understand all of these processes. So, you actually require to understand the transcription and translation events then only you can be able to modulate and you can be able to understand how we are actually over expressing the protein in the, in the host system. Now, when we talk about the um, under the in vitro system, under the in vitro system you have the two different species. One is you have the host cells which you are going to use as the uh, protein uh, production machinery and then you also going to have the transforming agents which will actually going to use for providing the instructions which means you are going to pro first use the instructions and then you put it that into the production machinery and that is how you are going to use that production machinery for the protein production. So, as far as the host cell is concerned you have the multiple choices you can use the prokaryotic system either the E. coli or other bacterial cells. You can use the eukaryotic system such as you can use the yeast, animals and plants uh, and uh, as far as the transforming agent is concerned you can use the different types of plasmids, you can use the mammalian uh, vectors, you can use the yeast vectors and that all we have discussed when we were discussing about how you can be able to clone a particular gene fragment into a, a vector of your choice. So, what we are going to discuss uh, is what we are we are just going to discuss about the prokaryotic expression system, we are going to discuss about the yeast expression system, then we are going to discuss about the um, animal expression system. Uh, so, these are the things we are going to discuss E. coli as an expression system which is going to be for the prokaryotic system, yeast as an expression system which is be a part of eukaryotic system and then we are also going to in insect cell line as an expression system and the mammalian expression system. Now, before getting into of these choices, so you, for a particular gene you have the foreign choices, right? You have four choices or even more than that, okay? The first question comes how you can be able to select and try uh, and select the particular expression system because every expression system has its um, positive and negatives. So, the number of factor need to be considered to choose the host expression system suitable for the over expression of a protein. The first factor is that the quantity of the desired protein. If the quantity protein required in a small quantity any host expression system can be suitable for the purpose. If the large quantity of protein is required such as uh, E. coli or yeast or baculo expression system might be more suitable than the mammalian expression system because mammalian expression system is 
going to give you a very small amount of proteins. Then it also depends on the size of the protein. The equally expression system is not preferred for a large protein size of the protein, but an, an equilateral expression system is more suitable for the large size proteins. Then we have the compatibility, compatibility between the source organism and the expression system. So in general, a close distance between the source organism and the expression system is preferred at may increase the chances of getting the expression of the clone gene and the presence of protein in the soluble fraction. Then we also require, we have to see the downstream application. So this is the most important criteria to choose a host vector system. If the protein production is for generating the antibody, any expression system may suit for this purpose. But if the protein is required for activity or for ELISA, then a compatible expression system is preferred. So downstream application, which means where you are going to use this particular protein is very, very important criteria to select any of these hosts. For example, you cannot use the bacterial expression system in case you are going to use the downstream product for developing the vaccine or utilizing them for using uh, for production for generation of the antibodies or something. Because then there is a chance that you might actually be able to get some bacterial products and these bacterial products are many time causes the allergic reactions into the patients. So if your downstream application is actually going to decide uh, what expression system is going to use. So uh, in the E. coli expression system, so in a typical e. coli component of an E. coli expression system, additional structural features are essential for an expression vector. Okay, what we have discussed when we were discussing about the cloning vectors, we said that it should have the origin of replication, it should have a multiple cloning site and so on. But if you want to talk about the expression vector, what you require is you require the promoter. So for a cloning vector, what you require, you require the origin of replications, right, number one. Number two, you require the multiple cloning site and number three, you also require a promoter because the promoter is going to decide uh, the protein production, right? So promoter, this is the upstream sequence to the gene and provides the docking site for the RNA polymerase. Then you also require the ribosome binding site. So ribosome binding site includes the Schindergano sequences and it is a docking site for the assembly of ribosomes. So you also require the RBS, right? And RBS is a ribosome binding site. And ribosome binding site is very important for the uh, binding of the ribosome so that it's actually going to initiate the translation. Then you also require the termination site. So it terminates the synthesis of the messenger RNA. And then uh, some cases you also require the affinity tag. So affinity tag is not essential. So, these are the component which are essential. The origin of replication, multiple cloning site, promoter, right? The presence of affinity tag either before or after the gene sequence provide a mean to purify the protein using the affinity chromatography. So these are we are going to discuss then only you will understand what is mean by the affinity tag and how it is actually makes the life easy for the researchers to purify the enzyme in bulk quantities. Now, as far as the promoter is concerned, uh, you, in, in a prokaryotic system, the prom promoter is uh, containing the some of the uh, classical features such as minus 35 regions and minus 10 region. So, tata box is there. So, you have the tata box and you also have the minus 35 regions. So, sequence at the minus 10 and minus 35 are crucial to facilitate the RNA polymerase and the subsequent determination of the strength of the promoter. So as good these sequences are like minus 10 region and minus 35 region, it actually going to decide how efficiently the RNA polymerase will go and sit to these region and that's how they are actually going to give you the better transcription. Uh, the nucleotide uh, substit uh, substitution in this region is severely affecting the turnover number of RNA polymerase binding and the transcription initiation side. Subsequently, a number of promoters are designed for the overexpression of the protein in E. coli using a strong or weak promoter to seed the overexpression strategies. 
So we have the IPTG inducible promoter. It is widely being used for to the construct uh, different expression vector to express the protein in E. coli. The different vector contain the lac promoter or its derivatives. So you have the three different types of promoter. You have the lac promoters. Examples of the plasmid is PUC series and PGM. Then you also have the uh, TAC promoters. So TAC is a uh, is a hybrid promoter where you have the some region of the tryptophan promoter and the lac promoter. So it is a hybrid promoter where minus 10 region is a from lac UV pipe promoter and it is fused with the minus 35 region of the tryptophan promoter. Example is PKK223-3. Then you also have the trick promoter. So trick promoter, it is similar to the tag promoter except that the distance separating the minus 10 and minus 35 region of the promoter is different from the tag promoter. The example is p trick 99 a so either of these plasmids can be used for generating the recombinant DNA and then you can be able to transform that into the suitable host and then you can be able to use this for uh, protein production. The, then we have the bacteriophage lambda promoters. So this promoter keeps the tight control over the protein production. It is regulated by the presence of repressor CLTPS 8057 to either repress the transcription or not. CLTP5857 is a temperature sensitive and degraded at high temperature and consequently in a temperature dependent fashion it represses the transcription at low temperature but not at a high temperature. This promoter is useful in cases where the protein is toxic in nature. So then we also have the bacteriophage T7 promoter. So similar to the bacteriophage uh, PL promoter, the T7 promoters is used to design the plasmid with tight control on the protein production. These vectors contain most of the structural blocks from the PVR T22 and the MCS in front of the T7 promoter to drive the transcription of the insert. Hence vector containing the foreign gene in front of the T7 promoter for the expression. So uh, T7, the host uh, E. coli also needs the modification to suit the T7 promoter and host E. coli is being transformed with a plasmid which carries the T7 RNA polymerase gene or the T7 RNA polymerase gene is integrated into the bacterial chromosome. In few host strain, T7 RNA polymerase is placed under the tight control of IPTG inducible LAC UV5 promoter to tightly control the production of the T7 polymerase. Uh, so either of these promoters, first step is that you are going to transform the recombinant DNA into the host and then you are going to do the protein production. How you are going to do the protein production? In the step one, you are going to do the transformation. So what you are going to do is you are going to take the recombinant plasmid and you are going to do the transformation into the suitable bacterial species or bacterial uh, strain and that's how you are going to get the transformed bacteria. And uh, you can dis you can use the multiple method of transformation. You can use the calcium chloride method, or you can use the electroporation. Then, just a step two, you are going to inoculate the single colony into a uh, suitable bacterial media such as LB media, right? And you can allow them to grow uh, into a 37 incubator. So. A single colony of the transformed colony is inoculated into a suitable media and it can grow up to a log phase such as the OD is 0 0.6 to 0.7 and then what you are going to do is you are going to induce so you are going to in the third step you are going to induce the bacterial species with the, uh, with the inducer such as IPTG for th 3 to 6 hours to produce the proteins. So you can do like that and then you are going to do a centrifugation or the collection of the bacterial cells. So in the step 4 you are going to recover the bacterial bacteria and analyze the protein expression. So bacteria can be recovered from the culture with a brief centrifugation at 8000 to 9000 rpm and analyze onto the SDS page. The detail of the SDS page will be discussed in a future experiment. Okay. Uh, the SDS page analysis of a particular expression study in, is given right and it indicates a prominent expression of the target protein in the induced 
cell as compared to the uninduced cell. So once induction is over, you can actually be able to do the centrifugation and that will actually going to give you the bacterial pellet. This bacterial pellet can be analyzed for the protein production. So what you can see here is this is the uninduced cells and these are the IPTG induced cells and what you see here is a very prominent band of the protein of your interest. So we have prepared a small demo clips to explain you how you can be able to perform or express a particular gene into the AKLI expression system. Hi everyone, myself Suram Banesh, research scholar at Department of Biosciences by Engineering, IIT Gavadi. In this video, we will show you how to induce protein expression in bacterial cells and how to analyze the uh, induction. Before that, the gene of interest which we want to express in bacterial expression system we have to transform that construct into bl21 de3 strain so bl21 cells specifically used for expression uh, expression of a particular protein once transformed into bl21 we have to pick the single colony and inoculate in a small volume of culture that culture we will use in scale up so i will show you how to inoculate how to take single colony and inoculate one colony in 5 ml of lb media and that we will use for further uh, experiments so this inoculation should be done in uh, laminar egg flow. So we will use laminar code to inoculate this colony. And also we have to note that the expression, if you having any uh, resistant marker like uh, ampicillin resistance, uh, kanamycin resistant, you have to include that antibiotic also in your culture media so that it will uh, specifically grows our strain or uh, our strain which expresses protein rather than non-specific bacteria although it is highly impossible, impossible but we still uh, it is good to be cashless. We have uh, inoculated single colony to LB media with a suitable antibody. Now what we have to do is keep in an incubator uh, till we, we get uh, growth of 0.4 or 0.5 OD before inoculating into large culture. So I will keep these files in incubator shaker. This is the incubator shaker. So we can actually rotate the base so that uh, uniformly the culture spread throughout the media. After we get growth, then we will inoculate into another culture that we will use for the induction analysis. As we can see the bacteria, the OD is around the uh, 0.37 to 0.4. So this is the right time for induction. We will use isopropyl beta D thiogalactosidase uh, galactoside as a inducing agent, uh, which we call it as short in short form we call it as IPTG. So uh, we will induce with the IPTG and also at the same time we have to add uh, antibiotic equivalent to this media 
so that uh, that will prevent any contamination which may be accidentally uh, comes into the flask while uh, doing uh, induction so this process should be carried out in uh, aseptic conditions that is in, that's why we will use laminar air flow for this purpose so let's induce the samples then we will keep it keep again back to the with better shape uh, this is 1 milli 1 molar iptg the amount of iptg which we have to add to uh, add for induction is depends on how much expression uh, you are putting how much expression you get in. so you have to optimize using different concentrations of iptg it is uh, 0.1 milli mole 0.5 1 milli mole so uh, I am going to induce After induction, we have to keep for 4 hours. Now the time is over, 4 hours is over. So uh, we have to centrifuge and get the pellet. That we will use for the uh, sonication and protein purification. As we can see, uh, the, it is almost over. So we can take out the gel, then we will stain and de-stain it. Generally, what we will do is we will. Uh, there are two ways of staining and de-staining process. One is we can do quick staining, like we have to heat it with the staining solution, which contains Kumasi Brilliant Blue and uh, along with uh, methanol and water so then we will try to distain with the uh, water uh, by heating but in another way the simplest simplest way is we will just uh, uh, stain the gel for 2 hours then we will distain overnight so I am going to show uh, the simplest way first we will stain in Kumasi Brilliant Blue staining solution then we will de-stain in methanol water containing uh, sap. So I am going to stop the uh, children, then I will remove it. I will show you how to remove the gel. Here we have to be very careful while taking out gel, otherwise the short plates may blow. On a corner we have to take and lift the gel like this. We we'll keep the, but it can sustain the. I will keep it for a uh, rotation for on a shaker for at least 2 hours then we will uh, de-stain over so once the time is over after 2 hours we will de-stain this solution we kept 2 hours in staining solution uh, we, as we can see the staining is uh, over like you can see the gel completely turned into blue. So we remove the solution. Then I am going to add de staining solution. And I will keep this on a 
Raghav for two hours per distance. So the composition content uh, for 100 ml of uh, distilling solution, uh, 40 ml of water, double distilled water and 40 ml of methanol and uh, 10 ml of glacial uh, acid. So I am going to keep uh, this on a rather. We have run the gel and uh, stained, right? stained and uh, de-stained. Now we will capture the uh, gel image. So, we can see manually also, but for record purpose, we have to capture it through gel dark. So, this is the gel dark uh, imaging system from BioRad. So, I will show you how to uh, take the capture the images. So, let So, here uh, we will use uh, white tray. There is another one. Uh, uh, gray or uh, uh, UV tray is also there. So there uh, you can see any fluorescent one or uh, stained with the ethidium bromide or blots, chemiluminescent blots you can use that. But uh, for uh, normal protein imaging we can use uh, this white tray. So I am going to keep the gel on this one. So, we have to open properly. This is very important step. You have to align the uh, tray in a proper way. So, otherwise it will show error. So, once it is over, you just push it back. So, we have to log on to account. So, this is a uh, SDS page. You can select the application, whatever you want. So here nucleic acids, protein gels, bloods, three different uh, categories are there. So we are observing here protein gels. Protein gels stained with the Kumasi blue. Or white tray, we are using white tray, so this is the right tray. You can use Kumasi blue stained one uh, gray tray also, but uh, we are using, as we are using white tray, so we will use Kumasi blue. So auto optimal, then I will ask for capture. So it will take uh, one to three minutes based on the signal intensity. So as we can see, it is optimizing the uh, signal intensity. You can minimize this one also so that you can see the gel image. So now it is over. If you want to do any modifications to image, for suppose you want to decrease or increase the signal intensity. So this kind of uh, changes you can do. So if you want to send this gel, you can have send or save. If you have any uh, drive connected to this one, you can send directly to this one, uh, that thing. So for image analysis part, uh, we will show in the upcoming video uh, how to analyze the what this band of interest correspond to which molecular weight. So we already loaded the molecular weight one so we can easily find out using image lab uh, software. In this video, uh, we have learned that uh, how to prepare a SDS page gel and uh, how to run it what are the precautions need to be taken while uh, preparing the gel and uh, how to observe how to record the gel using uh, uh, gel documentation system so i hope uh, this will give you uh, this will give you a gist of how to uh, prepare and run a sds page gel and analyze the protein sample. Thank you for watching.
in this demo clip uh, we have discussed different steps what you have to perform and then how you can be able to check the expression into a SDS page. Now there are many factors which are actually going to decide uh, the protein production into the E. coli expression system. So factor affecting the uh, protein synthesis in E. coli. Okay. So first factor is the translational efficiency. Okay. So translational efficiency is governed by the composition of the promoter, especially the sequence of the shine dargano sequences, which enables the binding of the ribosome protein production machinery. In addition, the distance between the shine dargano sequence and the start codon is also important for the efficient translation. Moreover, secondary structure of the promoter elements also affect the efficiency of the gene expression. Then the step two is the growth conditions. Growth media has a drastic effect on the protein production. Either the media component provide the raw material for the synthesis of the amino acid or provide the amino acid for the synthesis of a protein. In addition, the growth media rich with carbon source may provide high cell mass and as a result it will give you the more amount of proteins. Then the third is the codon usage. Okay, The third is the codon usage. Genetic codes are degenerate and there are 61 codes which are available for the 20 amino acids. So this is the genetic uh, code what you see, right? And there are 61 codes which codes for the proteins, whereas three, three codons which are for the stop codons. So these are the stop codons what you see and which does not code for any amino acid. Except these, uh, you are going to have the codon which is coding for one or other amino acids. As a result, the organism has a preference towards a set of genetic code. Expressing these sequence requires the tRNA to recognize the genetic code. But if the host expression system has no tRNA or low level of particular tRNA, then it will either delay the synthesis or stop the synthesis of a particular amino acid. Consequently, either it will produce less protein or the truncated protein. So what it means is that every organism has a preference over using some of the codons. For example, in the case of the phenylalanine, you have the two codons UUU, UUC, right? In, it is possible that in, in E. coli probably the UUU is more preferred codon. So in that case, it will actually going to have the tRNAs only for the UUU. But if you are taking a protein which is, you know, require, which does not have this codon, which you have the other codon, then either it will take the time for synthesis of these tRNA molecules or it will actually going to truncate the protein synthesis at that stage. So that is a very, very important uh, criteria to select the host as per the codon what is present in your gene. Then we have the expression of the fusion protein in E. coli. The protein in the E. coli expression system can be expressed as a hybrid protein where the reading frame of the two genes, one for the fusing tag and the other one is for the foreign gene are in a frame. The fusion tag can be placed either at the N terminus or the C terminus. So these are the some of the fusion tag, beta galactosidase, MBP, thyrodoxine, polyhistidine, GST and alkaline phosphatase and you can actually be able to use these are the vectors what you can use for tag and what is the advantage for example if you have beta galactosidase you can use the you can use that for blue blue white screening and as well as for affinity purification mostly these fusion tags are being used for affinity purification so that you can be uh, you know avoid the contaminating protein because the fusion tag will not be present in other protein but only present in your protein. So you, if you pass through this to a affinity column, only this protein is actually going to bind and the rest protein will not bind and that's how you will get the purification in single step. Uh, the advantage of the fusion proteins, it is going to make the easy purification. Uh, you might have seen that the with the help of the affinity purification, it can be a single step purification. Uh, Sometimes the tags are being put so that you can be able to target a protein into a particular compartment. So fusion protein can be targeted to the different cellular compartment for various regions such as the periplasm targeting sequences will allow the protein to accumulate into the periplasm and hence can help to the easy isolation. 
It can also modulate the half-life of the protein. In many cases, a fusion tag hides the potential protease site which are present on the foreign protein and enhances its half-life. Then it also increases the solubility. Keeping the tag at N terminal directs the protein synthesis and helps help in increasing the solubility of the foreign protein. Then we have the uh, how we can be able to remove the fusion tag. So for many biotechnology application, a protein is expressed as a fusion tag with N terminals or C terminals tag to easily purify the protein. But after the purification, the tag need to be removed for the downstream application such as vaccine or the protein crystallographic studies. A list of reagent is given, right? So these are the reagents what you can use. You can use the cyanogen bromide, you can use hydroxylamine, enterokinase, factor 10A, alpha thrombin, trypsin and subclin and they are all mostly the proteases except the cyanogen bromide which is a chemical and that is going to cleave just after the methionine. So if you have a tag and if you have a methionine here, right, so this is the tag actually and this is your uh, gene of interest, right. So, so it is have, having a methionine in between. So what will happen is if you treat that with the cyanogen bromide, it is actually going to cleave and that's why you're going to get two fragments, your tag and the gene of your interest, okay. So in many cases, it is very, very essential, especially the places where you are going to use this protein as a drug, for example, like for example, if you are going to use that like insulin, for example. So if you are going to put a say, uh, affinity tag on the insulin, it may actually cause the allergic reactions to the whole, to the patient. That's why these uh, affinity tag has to be removed. How you're going to remove the uh, fusion tag? So what you're going to do is, in general, the fusion tag junction point has either the protease cutting site or the site is sensitive for the chemical treatment. Treating the fusion protein with the protease or the chemical agent cuts the fusion tag to release the target protein. Passing the cleavage mixture allows the binding of the tag into the affinity column, whereas the target protein does not bind and comes out in the flow through. Target protein free of fusion tag can be collected and used for the downstream application. So this is what you have. In this particular, we are taking an example of the his tag. So you have made a chimeric protein. So that is having the his tag on one side and the protein of your interest on the other side. And then what you can do is you can actually be able to treat this with the thrombin because it has a thrombin cleavage size in between. So what thrombin is going to do is it is going to remove the his tag and the protein. And now what you do is you load this onto an affinity column and as a result what will happen is that his tag will go and bind to the beads whereas the protein of your protein is going to come out into the flow through and that's how you can be able to separate the tag from the uh, protein of your interest. So this is all about the bacteria as the host system for protein production. And what we have discussed, we have discussed about the different steps what you have to follow, which means in the step one, you are going to uh, transform the bacterial species, uh, bacteria with a with your recombinant DNA. And we have discussed many methods what you can use for transformations. Number two, you are going to do the screening or the selection of the transformed clones. Number three, you are going to grow a single colony, you are going to inoculate into the media and that's how you are going to induce. And the step four, you are going to induce that bacterial culture with the help of the inducer. So in this particular example, we have taken an inducer as the IPTG. And then once the induction is over for three to four hours, then you are going to collect these cells by centrifugations. And then you are going to utilize these uh, cells for analyzing the protein production in the SDS page. And once you are sure that the protein is being produced, then you can be able to lyse the cells and you can purify the protein for downstream applications. So this is all about the uh, different uh, aspects of the protein production in E. coli as an expression system. In our subsequent lectures, we are going to discuss more about the yeast expression system and as well as the mammalian expression system. So with this, I would like to conclude my lecture here. Thank you. Mm -hmm.